Hi, my name is Dorian, and this is You, Me, and the Industry, a podcast where I get to hang out with people from the games industry and talk with them about their job, the industry, and a bunch of other stuff. This episode, we continue the Jason Schreier Press Reset Special. The book tells the stories of game developers and what happens to their lives once the studios they've worked on for years get closed. This episode, I am joined by Joe Cadera, former lead combat designer at Big Huge Games on the title Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. Joe shares his story of becoming a game developer and how his competitive spirit played an integral part in the infamous combat pit. Furthermore, he shares details of the closure of Big Huge Games and we discuss how indie games are creating a better path for the entire games industry. Please enjoy. And welcome to the show. Today we continue this month's series of special podcast episodes. The special revolves around the book called Press Reset by journalist Jason Schreier. After reading his book, I wanted to create a sort of companion piece to some of my favorite chapters and decided to get in touch with a couple of people featured in the book. Just like Joe Codera, who is a former game and systems designer at studios such as Big Huge Games and Crystal Dynamics. He currently works at the consultancy called Recurver, which provides help to studios in form of design specs, as well as custom tools and technology. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dorian. Glad to have you. I'm glad (laughs) to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The pleasure is mine, yeah. Likewise, likewise. So, yeah. How how are you doing these days? Uh, Doing pretty well. The pandemic has been a real kind of curveball to life, but fortunately, I was already deep in remote work so i was able to um just get more time outdoors by the ocean and that's sort of my life right now is it's a lot of remote work and a lot of riding my bike along the ocean yeah i think you've been uh, you have been self-isolating quite well in the in the pandemic i've seen you've been like um what's like renting like a sort of like shed or something during the pandemic right I, I got a, a Santa Cruz rental, so I just moved the whole place here because I can have an office and a bedroom. Right. As, uh, my last place was just a tiny little one bedroom, and I couldn't really work and live out of the same spot. Right, yeah, yeah, totally. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, you know, I know for a fact that at one point you were sort of working on or planning something on the, long, uh, on the, on the lines of, like, an interactive podcast inspired by Jet uh, Abumrat. So I hope we get, uh, like, a nice interactive session in here. <laughs> 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 that's a deep cut yeah that's like definitely this like sort of a uh, interesting passion project of mine is yeah like interactive audio games oh wow and uh, like is it is it currently on hold or are you still working on that it's currently on hold and only because i know when it takes off it will be all consuming and i will lose my life to it and right now i really enjoy working in games still with game teams and um i don't necessarily want to get stuck in the venture capitalist crowd yeah oh man i'm sorry that i take one uh, one precious hour of your like uh, podcasting sort of like uh, free time <laughs> of you <laughs> no this is great this is, this is a good subject <laughs> yeah thanks and you know as it, as it is courtesy here um, i usually let the guests bring a topic to the show but uh joe uh, already gave me like a little sneak peek before we started the recording and uh, this is like so intertwined into the whole yeah prime subject of the of the episode we will just move it towards the end so um i guess you will all be uh, kept in suspense until we know what the topic will truly mm-hmm. be at the end like until the mm-hmm. final revelation <laughs> And yeah, like I said, um, this is like a special about the the book called uh, Press Reset, which you are also sort of a part of the book, I guess, which, uh, yeah, maybe sort of involuntarily, but also voluntarily. I mean, since you didn't write it, but um, it's, yeah, it's a story about your life. (laughs) Yeah, it has a lot more of my life story than I expected. I I just, um, I talked to Jason Schreier for a few interviews, maybe two, so I didn't expect to be in the book as much as I was, but I was really pleasantly surprised. I think he um, was very respectful with the information I gave him, mm-hmm. um, especially where it was potentially like controversial or right. it could be like misconstrued. So like I, he was just a really good um, journalist in that sense and gave me even an advanced preview of the book so I could um, make comments or notes if needed. And just, yeah, I felt pretty well represented. It was great. That's awesome, yeah. And did you ever sort of expect it to be like in this like huge mega seller of a book or were you just like, ah, you know, I think a couple of people will read it and it's fine? 
I knew that he had done Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, right. so I expected it would be red, and I expected it would be red, particularly like by employers <laughs> I used to work for. Right, so right, there right. Was, uh, there was a lot of sort of um, anticipation there of just like, well, we're going to see how this shakes out, but so far it's been great. Right, yeah, totally. And sort of, yeah, like what went you through your head after you read like the preview and also then the final the final version of the of the book? Uh, you know, it was such a, it was an interesting time because I was going through a lot of changes in, in terms of moving and what's going on with the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm one of those people that gets uh, imposter syndrome quite right. a lot, mm -hmm. where it's like, I'm just like, I have no business doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and I'll just like have this thought and I don't really know where it comes from. But I read that book. I was like, wait a second. I have so much like history in the mm -hmm. games industry. That right. like, it was just really neat just to see my own work history just sort of like written out in front of me. And obviously there's more, but um, just to see it in print, it just, there's a real sort of uplifting feeling. It's like, it's a reflection. It's like, this is kind of your life and this is just a slice of your life. But it, uh, it was encouraging in that space, especially if, or meeting me where I was feeling um, maybe not so capable in that moment. Yeah, right, totally. And also, yeah, I think th like your story especially is sort of very interesting because it is so intertwined with another chapter of the book called uh, Bloody Socks and your chapter is called Big Huge Problems. So like, was it like especially strange to you? Like where you were fully aware of what everything went down or were you just like reading it or like, whoa, like even I didn't know about like sort of this or that? Mm, no, I was pretty well informed. <laughs> okay. um, uh, mo I would say most of us at Big Huge and 38 right. were very well informed. I, maybe the 38 folks weren't as informed of the Big Huge games folks, but right. certainly, yeah, it, there was so much information sharing and there was so much information coming out in the just the few weeks of the um, collapse of Big Huge games and 38 studios that yeah, right. we, we knew plenty. There, there was certainly like tidbits of the 38 story that we didn't know but it all made sense if that makes any sense yeah right and yeah i mean like like you said it tells yeah a lot about your yeah the the things you went through in the games industry and right now i think you've been part of this industry for over 20 years is that right that's correct yeah i started wow. in april of 2001 yeah wow that's that's crazy crazy yeah And uh, yeah, you know, like um, like I did with the previous episode, I would like to know, you know, like little, like touch upon a little bit uh, what went down in all the the chapters in the book, and like what uh, like some of the stuff like maybe you, we get like a little bit of like behind the scenes information on a couple of like milestones. Um, just as I said, the um, this podcast episode is not like a replacement for the the book; it is sort of a companion piece. So I highly encourage you to pick up the book uh, by Jason, as you already heard by um, the other guests, and now by Joe himself. Uh, it is a great book and J Jason really <laughs> did uh, did all the work and uh, I think all the guests so far appreciated his his interview styles and um, the work he put in. Um, yeah, so maybe let's just start uh, right at the beginning. So yeah, the book covers how you got into the games industry. So yeah, it covers like aspects of like you going to arcades and uh, meeting up with some game developers. Uh, yeah, I guess some, some people from QA and then yeah, this was the way you sort of, yeah, got into the industry, right? Yeah, that's correct. I um, I really fell in love with Tekken during my college years, and mm -hmm. I was playing a lot of uh, Tekken Tag Tournament. And it turned out where I lived happened to just be a very competitive space for that game. Um, so there was a, a golf land, it was sort of like a mini golf space um, in Sunnyvale, and uh, I would go there pretty much every evening and, and play. And on Wednesdays, there would be this group of guys that would come and play and they, they certainly knew each other they were a little bit older mm -hmm. they played a little bit differently they played more for fun rather than playing to win um a lot of us at the arcade we would play to win and we'd so we would be really ruthless with our strategies and and dominating it was it was very normal to see like win streaks moving into like the 20s 30s and 40s and these guys would just sort of just have fun and they'd take turns sort of like <laughs> doing stupid stuff and sometimes exploiting glitches. Uh, but I, so I, I got along with them really well just mm -hmm. because they played in a different way and it was just fun to be around them. But um, the three of them, it was um, this guy, Sam Villanueva, who was a designer at Crystal Dynamics at the time. And then Torin, I can't remember Torin's last name, um, but Torin was a producer at Sony 
and this other guy Ryan and again I can't remember Ryan's name last name maybe Graves but he was also a designer at Sony and um, they've all moved on to other things like Torin as he went on to do the Killer Instinct franchise for Xbox mm-hmm. so they they were just really just amazing people and I asked them I <laughs> word got around that they were in the game industry and I was, just did not even know you could work in games. It just never even occurred to me. I was like, here I am playing games, and I just assumed that, I don't know. They just they never thought that it could be. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. So I asked them how they all got their start, and they had all started in QA. And there was this kind of like, come to think of it, Joe, you'd be pretty good at it, and if you ever want to like get in, let us know. And I was fast forward to about um, maybe a year later, I just hit this moment where... Um, my financial aid fell through, my living situation fell through tragically, and I just needed a change. So I thought, you know, I've been trying for a graphic design in college, and that's interesting, but games sound so much more interesting now that, I, that I'm aware of it. Mm-hmm. Let me just put everything into that basket and see if I can get that job. So I wrote up a resume, I handed it to Sam Villanueva, and asked him to pass it on like he had promised. and. Four months later, I got a call from Crystal Dynamics QA department, and they were hiring up for testing of what would be Soul Reaver 2. And so I came in for an interview, and they hired me and my best friend, Greg. And we were that got me and Greg to like stay in, in the Bay Area because cost of living is already starting to go up. This is 2001. Crazy mm-hmm. to think of that. And yeah. Um, yeah, so we were able to share an apartment and have the same job and share a commute and just became like this really kind of like wonderful outcome of like this <laughs> just gut. Let me just try this thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, maybe two questions uh, associated to that. So the first one is like, did they sort of even introduce you to like terminology, like bugs and like glitches and all this stuff because like they knew what they were talking about since they were game developers? Oh, there was very little information given. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was just like, we do QA. Oh, tell me more about that. But <laughs> clearly they had had so many conversations like that. It right. was just the very passive, like, uh, we're just going to play our games and we're going to move on. And <laughs> okay. So it, it was it was really kind of a closed off group and they weren't necessarily helpful in the sense of right. telling me about games, but they were certainly helpful in telling me about bugs and glitches in right. Tekken. Right. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the second question is like, who was your main back then? Um, well, second tag, so you you would play two characters, right? Um, but I was pretty well known for playing what we called Team Korea, so that's Big Dusan and Horong, uh, the two Taekwondo characters. So I was probably best with them. Although I also played Law and Panda, and I had this weird Law Panda team that did pretty well as well. Because in it was great because Law is basically Bruce Lee. He's mm-hmm. in Tekken. He's got a the one inch punch, right. and Panda could do this launch move that would launch him super high, tag out into Law to come in, and then he had time to juggle with the one inch punch move, which was just a lot of fun to perform. <laughs> I, I I can already see it in my head. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great. I I, I really love Tekken. It was just a really fun game um still is a lot of my friends still play and many of them are actually in the industry at this point oh that's awesome yeah and uh, yeah so you then you started out at, at qa so what was it like back then like uh was it so like uh, I, i think yeah the guest previously talked about like get like an old build to like find all as, as much bugs as possible then you have to write them down and then once you got like enough bugs and the reporting was uh, well enough then you got hired so did you had like some sort of like initiation phase Mm, uh, Crystal Dynamics was a pretty small studio. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a mix of just a bunch of creative and nerdy types. So there was just this sense of like a lot of fun was being had. They would right. have beer on the patio at, at, after work. We'd all go for long walks. This is in sort of um, downtown Palo Alto area. So we'd go for long walks to, to the park and grab a bite to eat and walk back. Most everybody in QA was happened to <laughs> ride skateboards. So that fit really well with me. Um, and so we'd just take skate breaks or, uh, I, everybody was just kind of really cool. And there were sort of a lot of overlaps between people, like whether it was bands that you liked or, mm-hmm. um, concerts that you would go to, uh, food that you would eat together. So obviously games. So it was just a real kind of like homegrown vibe and very like, 
not familial, but just certainly like like friends. QA was pretty small. I think we were about 10 people at the mm-hmm. time. And uh, I would be testing, I, I tested, uh, the first game was Anachronox, which was an Iron Storm game. And, yeah, right. Uh, later Silver Weaver 2. And what you would do is sort of just play the game. You log a bug into, we had a web-based database, um, like interface for FileMaker. Um, you log your bug, you print out the, especially if the bug was hard to, to reproduce, you mm-hmm. would um, record it on VHS tape. Wow. And then print out the bug on paper uh, and then wrap it around the VHS tape and then go store it into this like shelf with that was numbered by bug order. So that way, if a programmer needed to see the bug in action, they could go find the bug on this shelf with VHS VHS (laughs) tapes and then play it. It was really just kind of wild west. This is just how we had to do things back then. Yeah, Um, crazy. I mean, I was already hired as a contract uh, contractor mm-hmm. there and right. so and because crystal dynamics was such a small studio and people knew that i played fighting games and was into electronic music they were welcoming so i could go down into the audio engineers room or the, the music room and talk about synthesizers mm-hmm. and then, or um the combat designer was really into um samurai showdown and i had never realized how intricate that game would be but he would bring in his neo geo and we'd play <laughs> And right, showdown. He'd show me all the just crazy tricks that he would be doing back in the arcades ten years before me, right? Yeah. And so his name is Riley Cooper, and Riley and I like we would spend late nights working on boss battles together. Mm -hmm. Like I'd have to do these boss battles. You've been playing the game a lot, Joe. Let's balance these boss battles. Um, So it was a real just kind of like ad hoc vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess this was sort of like the origin story to your like. Yeah, sort of career into the the yeah legendary combat pit and uh, the combat designer of uh, yeah, games like Kingdoms of Amal Reckoning. Yeah, there's there's a long path through there, but um, essentially, I I went to Sony to do QA for a little bit, and I learned oh, Sony QA was much more like a farm. There were hundreds of testers, oh, and wow. they weren't mm-hmm. allowed to talk to the to the developers. And I got to play and test a lot of games. I had a leadership position there on a game called SOCOM, mm-hmm. and I also worked on a p- bunch of other games, but met a lot of great testers that really had a lot of ambition. And so the moment Crystal Dynamics um, had available spots, I went right back as the lead tester right. and hired hired up all the best out of Sony and um, built our own QA department. And from there, yeah, I went into production, did production for a couple of years. And the, the whole idea there was, learning production would make me a better designer. And that's what my um, lead producer taught me. He, like I, I asked him, I, I said, I want to be a designer for you on your team. And he said, be my producer first and you will be a much better designer in the future. And I can make that happen. So that, that's the deal we made and that's the deal he kept. And um, I was able to move on to gameplay and combat design from there. Yeah, right. I think because at one point you said um, the best designers are multidisciplinary, right? Like they have like multiple disciplines. I certainly think so. Yeah, yeah I think the more, the more uh, like hobbies or ability, ways to think about the world, uh, the greater the designer's skill. Right. And do you think there's like sort of like a um, certain traits of like people who are like totally unfamiliar with like basic combat design, to, like coming sort of left field and with like unique ways of thinking um, to add something to the combat design, or is it more like yeah, you have to get the basics down at first? I really, I, there's so many ways in. I, I know a lot of people that come in through art or oh, wow, okay. even, um, just a technical sort of understanding. Some people actually just have a love of martial arts and programming, oh. and that's what gets them into combat design. Um, some people love the math and the spreadsheets of it, and that's mm-hmm. what gets, and they, they don't even, even see the, the the beauty of the human form aspect <laughs> of it, but, yeah. but they learn that over time, and that's mm-hmm. the thing is that, Combat gameplay is sort of, it's like any other gameplay, but it just requires that the team works together because it requires so much knowledge in all these different disciplines. Yeah, right. um, so I like I, I don't think there's any right or wrong way to start it. It's mm-hmm. just if you have an interest and it takes you in that direction, then follow it. Right, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I guess after six years you've spent at uh, Crystal Dynamics, you moved on to join uh, Big Huge Games. That's right, yeah. I, um, one of uh, a designer, a good friend of mine, Patrick Connor, had moved to Baltimore, and um, he was a designer on 
at Big Huge Games, mm-hmm. and he uh, sent me a message one day, just like, Joe, they need you. They don't even know that they need you. I'm going to put your <laughs> name in the hat <laughs> for a hire, and right. um, we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. And that turned into an interview, which turned into um, me traveling out there just to go say hello um, and just meet the team. And as I met the team, I also met their um, consultant, who was Eric Williams, who had been a lead combat designer on God of War 2. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had been a combat designer on God of War 1, and he was now a consultant. And so him and I hit it off really well. We both identified each other as like being from the fighting game scene. He knew Sunnyvale Golfland, um, mainly from the Street Fighter crowd. And I knew all of his friends from the Street Fighter crowd, including one of his roommates. And um, yeah, we just hit it off really well. And Eric wrapped up that visit by telling the team if you hire Joe, you don't need me. And he really just laid out a red carpet for them to essentially, if they hired me, like not rely on his very expensive at the time work. So that was just a really great gift that he gave me. And mm-hmm. he's just been a champion for me and ever since we met. And I really appreciate that guy. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think in the book, it's also featured that they sort of showed you some of the gameplay of the game. Um, but yeah, it was maybe, I mean, it looked really good, right? Yeah, they showed me a video of the game, but they didn't actually play it. All right. Because <laughs> apparently at the time it was totally unplayable. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of it was smoke and mirrors kind of moment. But oh, wow. that, that happens in game development. It's okay. I mean it's crazy. You you usually would think that it's just like, you know, just just to get like um yeah, like marketing going or like get like pre orders coming in. But in this case it was just like, well, we sort of need to convince this this person to join our team, so let's just hit them with like the, the big marketing trainer. Oh, it wasn't it, it wasn't even that. It was oh, like no. it was uh it was their pitch demo that they had done for THQ. Oh, okay, sure. So they had that build ready. So it wasn't like they rolled out this whole big operation just oh, okay. to convince me. <laughs> But that's all they had and they didn't bother telling me that what they had playable right. was essentially totally broken. But it, again, that's just the game industry. It's like stuff breaks all the time. We often move into fields we don't know what we're doing and we have to sort of just fake it until you make it. Right, yeah. But I mean, like, could you maybe go into a little bit into detail about, like, what you felt after you realized that, like, wait a minute, <laughs> the, wait, like, wait, oh, like, this isn't real. <laughs> so I, I mentioned that my buddy Patrick Connor had been there, and he, he had been working on um, the AI and the enemies, right. and w- when I got there um, and realized that, yeah, ev- everything wasn't wor- working, and um, the game was being essentially built in uh, script so it'd be like script play animation and then right. at this time do damage <laughs> and it was like really <laughs> rudimentary kind of stuff where I'm used to like okay we're gonna at- attach collision volumes onto these things mm-hmm. and these collision van- volumes are gonna reference the damage property elsewhere and I was just used to much more advanced tools because I've been at Crystal Dynamics and it's just it has a very advanced tool set right yeah mm-hmm. and yeah I was just wait a second there's so much work to be done here i don't and i don't even know if anybody around me understands the the enormous sort of weight of how much work needs to be done here before they even start seeing what they want to see which is like a beautiful hammer swing Mm -hmm. and so patrick and i would just we would take long lunches we'd hang out after work and we would just complain and (laughs) we would just vent all of our frustrations with each other and he i think really that's what patrick wanted me there for he just wanted somebody else that understood the challenge <laughs> in his town that he could talk to and uh i became that and so patrick and i just like became good just vent buddies as we always have been um and uh yeah it was it was you know like i've had a lot of moments like that you get on a team and you just realize that there's just a lot more work to do than mm-hmm. they thought or you thought and right. that's just That happens more often than not at this point. But that was my first moment of realizing it. Mm -hmm, Yeah, right. And then you sort of found it like the 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 infamous combat pit, right? Yeah, the um, the, they started by sitting me next to the animator, the Mm -hmm. lead animator. Uh, His name is Young Bo, and I remember for the first week, Young and I just didn't even talk. I didn't even know why he had sat there. Nobody even told me like. (laughs) who he was and he was just so quiet he always had his headphones on i said hello but we didn't really Mm -hmm. (laughs) engage until 
a week later, I was oh, you're the animator. You're the animator I'm going to be working with. Like, nobody told me, and you've been so quiet. Okay, let's just start talking. And, um, yeah, we carved out a, a room for ourselves that was squeezed about seven desks in there and slowly but surely just started hiring additional animators. Um, there, we already had most of the combat design people that we needed. Um, in fact, there was an internal team there was a second team that was doing another project and um, that project got canceled mm-hmm. fairly early on. And on the way to the meeting, uh, this young guy, Justin Perez, just walked right up alongside me and I knew who he was, but we hadn't really talked much. And he just said, hey, uh, I want to be on your team. I want to be a combat designer. I was like, cool. So like he just was so <laughs> already primed for it and mm-hmm. wanting it. Uh, and the moment that he saw that his project wasn't going to work out, he immediately like allied himself and i just uh so i was able to like at least cultivate enough of a um culture there that people right. wanted to be part of that if that's something that they were interested in so we had a good sized team uh, it, was, it was seven people in that room and another additional um side room with mm-hmm. two to four people and i think all told we finally got to about like 14 people or so but the main thing was just um just seeding people that need to talk to each other. Like right. in combat, especially melee combat, you really need your designers and your animators to be sitting next to each other. At at first, when you're just starting out, you need your designers and your programmers to be working mm-hmm. side by side. But the programmers often need just some silence just to think and to work. And so it was fine for them to be in, in their own offices. Right, but yeah. mm-hmm. eventually, you just get to this moment of, you need to be able to lean over to see the animators work and if you see something, say something about the, the feedback or like, hey, I see, I like what you're doing or I see that you're doing this. I was wondering if we could move this direction as well or they can throw an extra pose and say, hey, I was thinking, what if I did this? And you, it would just spawn a conversation of how might we make this really cool action work in the game? And you only get that by sitting next to each other. Mm-hmm. and having as low friction as possible to communication. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and speaking of friction, so it was like what was really good, at least what described in the book, is that you were able to, yeah, sort of present what you made to each other very fluidly, easily, and um, then the whole team would be, like, checking out, like, what they were working on, and then um, they would sort of, like, nitpick little things and say, well, this doesn't, doesn't work, we need to fix on this. And uh, what I found interesting, that's, like, sort of, like, no one took it personally, but I think... Um, I mean, this is like a very tight uh, balance, right? Because like once things get heated in like sort of like design decisions or like sort of um, like even like, for example, when you're crunching or something, I guess people are like more on the edge. So like, how did you balance this? Uh, You're absolutely right. I think, um, and we got into a lot of feedback that I think we would have taken personally otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, The way that we got through that was just by doing extra non-work activities together. We would take big breaks out of the day, and like well, just the whole um, Jason Schreier describes the uh, the combat pit challenge, um, where it started one day, we had a pull-up bar that was set up at the gateway to our office, and one of the programmers came through, just talked about how many pull-ups they might be able to do, and um, it got this whole conversation going, and then finally he just went for it and did, I think, like, you know, five or six, and then somebody else said, I bet I can do more, and well, it became less about even, like, who can do the most, it just became about how many can we do, mm-hmm. and so um, I just opened up a spreadsheet and started logging everybody's names and how many pull-ups they did and we ended up ranking them and saying well that was interesting what what would we do next week right like and the conversation just naturally turned into this weekly challenge where um the loser of the previous challenge was able to choose the challenge for the next week and that so that way it wasn't always necessarily a feat of strength right or Mm -hmm. dexterity and Mm -hmm. we had one animator uh lou farina who works at for axis now he was consistently on top of the feats of strength as well as dexterity uh so like there was just a sense that lou would probably win in the end but it got what it got us doing was just um hanging out together and having fun together and doing sometimes silly things uh we did a staring contest and (laughs) there were there were a lot of rules 
rules for like how the steering contest would need to work in order to not cheat because everybody's so good at just gaming systems so we had to figure out okay so we're going to sit you in front of each other we're going to put a site blocker in between the two competitors and then uh, we'll set a timer and you have two judges to look at each person staring and we will lift the site blocker and then count the timer and then um, whoever whoever blinks first loses right and um we that happened to be the first day for like a korean animator that had just joined the team as well as a, a programmer and it was just hilarious to watch these people who had never met each other just engage and jump into a staring contest and that's right. their first day of work you know and just like <laughs> like it, that's awesome it, but yeah. It, it, yeah it gets everybody sort of loose so right. that way when you can finally give that feedback of um even if it's critical or nitpicky mm-hmm. or whatever, you, you understand where the people are coming from. Right, yeah. You understand mm-hmm. what they're trying to do. You understand their sensitivities. And we also understand who in the room is more likely to call something out versus who isn't right. and who might be like holding back. Right. Mm-hmm. So it could, it allowed me to sit back and be like, Oh, you know what? Um, Jay is not saying anything, but I bet Jay has something to say. Okay. So yeah, let's that's... give the talking stick to Jay and see what he has to say. And so it would just, by hanging out together, by spending time together, we got to understand more how to communicate when it mattered. One added bonus is we had an animator that was, um, he had formerly served in the Navy on, on a submarine. Mm-hmm. And his name is Johnny Walker. And he's just amazing at easing tension. And like he always had a joke for the moment. And oh, like, wow. when, when things get, would get tough or difficult, uh, you could kind of always count on jo- Johnny to find a way to cut through it and mm-hmm. um, speak to what needed to be said without necessarily hurting any feelings. It was just a really amazing sort of person to have on the team. That's awesome, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it would be just a waste of uh, like my precious precious time if I don't, like, had at least a couple of questions related to combat. I know si- since the days of, um, yeah, the studio closing, you've been... Um, moving a little bit away uh, from the combat designs and everything, but I still would like to <laughs> ask a couple of questions related to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, like, you know, like, um, like the studio has closed, but since then, like, so many, like, great combat uh, designs has been coming up or, like, people talking about all the time, you know, like, may it be, like, Dark Souls or, you know, like, Arkham or, like, all the all the stuff, like, Last of Us. People are talking about, like, combat more in depth now, I think, uh, with, like, combat no more propping up. So, like, but to you, like, how would you define or how would you say this is like a good combat combat system? Would, is it just by feel or can you already, just by looking at it, you say like, oh, yes, I already, I can already tell this is fun to play. Uh, I think my history lets me just look at a, a title, you just even in action and understand uh, whether it's going to be good or not. And, and right. I say good in a way that I'm going to enjoy it. Sure. Um, because I understand the constraints that they're working with, right? Are they being realistic? Are they using a lot of motion capture? And if they are using a lot of mo- motion capture, are there a lot of sequences where two actors are tied together? Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, like For Honor, I really wanted to to like it, but it had so many just um, ties to realism and motion capture that I real that I understood that it was an uphill challenge. I I so, certainly played it to understand. Mm-hmm the types of solutions that they went for, but myself knowing the challenges that they were dealing with, I knew like eventually that would not be a game that I would be sinking my teeth into long-term. Right. Yeah. I think working on combat, just that big, huge, but also beyond um, consulting on it with other titles, it, it gets me a lot of sort of visibility into different types of challenges and and different types of solutions. Mm -hmm. So I'm always willing to be surprised and I, still love great combat games but for me it's really about like are we capturing a good story are we telling a good story through combat Mm -hmm. and if and if so then i want to i want to see that so like sekiro certainly the souls games have been great and telling a story i wouldn't say they're the best they they don't make design decisions i would have made but Mm -hmm. they make but they're good design decisions for the game but lately, I just, you know, I plugged in my PlayStation 3. I'm going to go back and play some old Yakuza just because <laughs> I, I really love the Yakuza series. And as campy as it is, and it does feel dated, right. like I play for <laughs> a different reason. And it, certainly fighting games will always keep me playing just because mm-hmm. that fighting game nature is just like 
it's so much fun. It's great to see top tier players right, yeah. perform at their best and understand what it is that they're, they're doing. And I mm-hmm. feel like I only really understand it by playing fighting games. Okay, yeah. And you already mentioned like from software and Souls titles, but um, what I always wanted to know: so is there like a sort of different approach to like from different nations? So do you think like Japan tackles the, mm. the, the, the the combat question in a totally different way than Western studios? I know like throughout the years it has been more streamlined but can you still feel like oh yeah this is like a typical japanese thing or like a typical western thing that they put more emphasis on this or that yeah it's i'd say the stereotypes were easier to nail 10 years ago 20 years ago even um but some of those still hold up and um obviously we can always find exceptions Mm -hmm. the The Souls games really follow a Japanese designer mindset of I have set a challenge for you and you you must beat it. Right. And that and that to me was always very like traditionally Japanese game design of like this is very like if you think about the Mega Man games, this is a very bespoke custom challenge and not that there's only one way through it, but um, you, you don't have a whole lot of um, help going right. through it. And mm-hmm. the front, the Souls games and Souls likes sort of embrace that mindset. This is a very, this is a difficult game, and this is a difficult game for a reason. Ninja Gaiden was like that as well. The timing can be very, very strict in the Ninja yeah, yeah, Gaiden right. series. Uh, so it it follows that sense of like mm-hmm. I have made a masterpiece as a designer, and it is your job as a young apprentice game player to master the game that I have created for you. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. So I've always appreciated that style, but I think also out of Japan came all the like the Devil May Cries, right? And right, um, yeah. these games that move from pose to pose with so much fluidity and mm-hmm. so much action being presented, and it and that speaks to I think I, their love of manga and anime. Mm-hmm. And if you think about manga and anime, it's just a, incredibly efficient in showing poses and showing action that's true. and you take that efficiency and you put translate that to video games mm-hmm. and that's where you come up, get a bayonetta or a devil may cry and i think um right that describes the very japanese mindset mm-hmm. to me western uh we certainly move towards gore a lot god of war did that obviously and um god of war embraced the button mashy gameplay and that was a very western thing of like right, we're just yeah. gonna we understand that players are going to hit the buttons until they've sweat all over their controller and they want to have fun. Mm-hmm. So we will allow them to do that mm-hmm. and, and have a lot of fun with that. So I think that's, and, and Western game de- development moves towards a Hollywood style. And I, I, I mean the West coast of the right. United States, mm-hmm. the East coast is very heady where they think of things more in terms of board games typically, or um, D and D role playing. So you can imagine Skyrim, right? Or any of the Firaxis games, uh, they, they tend to be more thinking about chances and percentages, um, choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I'd say Scandinavia, like, it's more heavy on the first-person physics-based sort of um, quality of yeah. games. Mm-hmm. Where, like, less so on the animation side, but mm-hmm. more so on the, what do, what do weapons do? And yeah. It's more about how cool are the weapons. That's awesome, yeah. And uh, why do combat designers hate hate combat barks just as much as voice actors and writers? Because <laughs> uh, they tend to be an afterthought, I guess. Um, and that, going back to my comment about a uh, game combat telling a good story, mm-hmm. it's probably because the combat designers and we did this at Big Huge. The combat pit was so separate from the actual story, and when we sort of looked back over. The release of Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, mm-hmm. we thought, what is the one thing that we would do better? And we said, we all knew that it was better integration with the story. That meant like every boss battle having meaning and not just in the boss battle itself, but also in the space leading up to the boss right, battle. And the yeah. level, like really let the player mm-hmm. understand that this this character matters and we want to defeat them or have a relationship through that combat. Um, so embracing story is not something that most combat teams do from the start they tend to eschew story they tend to so they there are usually the players that skip cutscenes. they are usually the player that skip dialogue right yeah. they just want to get to the action so combat developers are very similar and they 
when it comes time to writing barks, mm-hmm. they can't even wrap their heads around it. Like I'm <laughs> certainly guilty of, I'm like, oh my God, I have 200 bark lines to write. Like how many <laughs> variations of I see Lara, get her, you know, whatever right. it is. It's like how, how many, like I'm not a writer. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Most combat designers aren't writers and they just don't think in those terms. So it's a, it's a special skill and there's certainly room for more writers to move into the combat space. Wow, that's interesting, yeah. And yeah, the last combat related question is, um, I saw you once tweet about like the game called Urban Chaos and that there was a secret internal build that was uh, more akin to like, or like the, had like the origins of like the Batman combat system from, um, what's oh, from Rocksteady. Called? Yeah, Rocksteady, exactly. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Could, you, could you maybe shed some light on like, what was, what would that look like? Uh, yeah, so I, that was around 2006 or 2007. Um, I was at Crystal Dynamics and we were a part of IDOS Interactive. Yeah, right. mm-hmm. So IDOS had moved from San Francisco and Crystal had moved from Menlo Park and we had moved to the same building in Redwood City. So IDOS was on the first floor and Crystal was on the second floor. Right. And because I knew combat and was doing I was doing combat on Team Raider Underworld at the time also, mm-hmm. somebody from IDOS had brought up a build and given it to one of the studio heads or lead designers at crystal right. and so they had it running on a machine and they just said hey joe in case you're interested there's a really interesting build from rock study study you should go mm-hmm. check out so uh i yeah i went into the room and just it was uh, essentially just a test room with uh, batman and some goons and you could use the cape you could dash you could fight you could counter essentially all the basics of mm-hmm. what arc night would become and Mm -hmm. um it was instantly fun and i spent so much i spent easily like a good hour hour and a half just understanding what they were doing and breaking it down and really being impressed because up until that point there was sort of a formula for fighting games Mm -hmm. whether it was a 2d fighting game or a third person fighting game yeah right and this was inventing a whole new formula mm-hmm. and you can see it in all the superhero fighter sets. It's like it, be- it becomes the template that we look at if yeah, we right. want to make a Spider-Man or a Batman game, if whoever somebody makes a Superman game, which they probably won't, yes. um, you know, but any superhero fighter, we're going to be comparing it to Batman first and um, what yeah. rock said, they, they really came up with a mental map that made a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and you feel like Batman when you play it. <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a great combat system. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that, uh, yeah, I guess uh, the, the other project, um, the people at uh, Big Huge Games were working was canceled. And um, yeah, I think you, this was also around, I guess, around the time you sort of started getting, um, yeah, a little bit nervous what was happening at uh, THQ because they started to sell like, uh, yeah, like studios or they had to close down studios. And then they also decided to, yeah, they had to sell Big Huge Games and then the, you sort of, ended up being like uh, sort of paraded around uh, through like I guess different investors and companies so maybe you could um, yeah talk a little bit about what was that like yeah it was a uh, real uncertain knowing that the studio will close within a matter of months or days even um yeah and yeah I just had this sort of um sense of going back to my partner at the time and saying, I don't know if I'm going to have a job in two months. And we, we, we were, we were not prepared to like get up and move. We had just bought a house. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was pretty crazy, but just like, well, we'll just figure it out. And, um, even the head of big huge was saying like, take some time, work on your resumes. <laughs> and I, I get that there's a lot of excitement about the people coming in, potentially the, by us but um don't get too excited because it doesn't mean anything until you have a check right and yeah so very but what was really cool is the entire studio relied on everybody within the team to present so right. quite a lot of us whether we were leads or not were presenting our own content presenting the tools and walking uh, various investors through the or potential investors through the tools right mm-hmm. so yeah so i it, it was interesting because one day it would be, I don't know, EA. Another day it would be Take Two mm-hmm. or Two K, and 
I would recognize some people that I knew. <laughs> that, that was always fun because like, hey, yeah, cool, imagine. like that producer that gave me that shot to be a producer and then his designer was um, a guy named John Sh- Shawanek or Chow. Mm-hmm. And Chow was now at 2K and so he was part of that crowd that came through and saw me present the combat pit. And in fact, like we almost this is probably previewing a little bit, but we almost sold to 2K. In fact, I didn't realize how close we were to selling Big Huge to 2K wow. yeah. because of that presentation. I remember, and I eventually went went to 2K as a design director, and um, folks there remembered me from that presentation and remembered me from the combat pit and just saying like how cool it was that we had created what we had done um both the tool set but also just sitting animators and designers together yeah right <laughs> yeah but in the end it uh it was Kurt Schilling that went uh yeah through the doors and then decided to buy um yeah big huge games and yeah sort of like uh yeah combined like I don't want to say combined but it was like sort of in the family of 38 studios so what was the feeling when you saw like this like huge like baseball player right coming into the doors honestly I had no idea who he was <laughs> <laughs> I had seen um, oh, what's the it's the movie with Jimmy Fallon and I can't remember maybe Drew Barrymore but it was like a there's a movie about like that actually takes place at the World Series game where mm-hmm. um, he wins for the Red Sox and so I knew of the whole like Curse of the Bambino and everything because of this movie right uh, that he had he has supposedly won or broken and um, he's I mean Kurt was just a he's just a big guy with a big personality mm. and honestly he's really um warm and so it, he's a little bit gruff but he's definitely just like he, he's likable and mm. i think people want to like him and and he wants people to like him so he goes like you may only have a few seconds to interact with him but he doesn't leave you feeling like sure he's a sleaze ball he makes you feeling like you're part of a, a team now and that, that was that was really cool to see kurt come through and and be that way and sort of uh ra salvatore like i also didn't under- know his of his writing um but friends of mine did and certainly plenty of the employees at big huge did yeah right. and there was just a sense that like cool we've got a lot of runway and there was certainly uncertainty and some hand wringing in the studio um mm-hmm. in, in the combat pit but what we would do is i just sort of close the door one day and I don't think this is verbatim, but paraphrasing, kind of just talk to the team and say, look, what we have built is the foundation for combat, and we've been doing it in a way that lets us pivot towards right. a lot of different styles. Mm-hmm. So just think about everybody else in the studio that has to rewrite, has to wipe all their story away, has to wipe all right. their levels away. Mm-hmm. We're going to lose some of the character art, but we can keep the rigs all the animations we can preserve so much of the work that we've done in terms of tool set in terms of process um Mm -hmm. we we were absolutely the best set to be moving forward for that game and that that came true for reckoning it was um we all everybody looked at the game and said what is the best thing about this game that we can push forward and Mm -hmm. everybody said combat and so that's when we doubled the combat team to really deliver on that promise Yeah, right. And I mean, yeah, you just mentioned that he's a likable person, but I think there's like this one particular anecdote in the in the book that I just love that uh, like he sent you like at 2 a.m. like a mail about like uh, the combat in I think like I don't know something related to God of War, and uh, you were like kind of like anxious and replying that like well we can't do this or something like on the lines of like declining to his like requests. So what was that like? Uh, yeah, and that happens a lot in this industry. But it's sort of <laughs> the, yeah, you get when it's the person with the money right um, <laughs> the big boss there's a little bit extra to saying <laughs> no or yes there's a lot of pressure to say yes even if they don't know it right yeah right and that that happens even for for leads uh they may have a passing comment about something and someone mm-hmm. will take that someone more junior will take that as direction when that person didn't mean it that way right yeah so i knew that's sort of where kurt was operating from but the 2 a.m email thing was like oh boy like i just <laughs> didn't know I didn't know enough about him to right. know whether this is going to be a thing now he's trying to push or or not. So I really just had, I spent a lot of time, I was probably up till like 4 a.m. that night composing that email. It was a lovely like, you know, four or five paragraph yeah, essay. Right. But co- constantly re- rewriting, I guess. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. And just making sure that he understood that right. I understood him. And exactly. That we could potentially take that way, but it would require a bunch of other things. And um, yeah, fast forward to, I, I just hadn't heard from him since. He never replied and months passed and we presented the game at PAX East. Right, yeah. And in his introduction to me, he, <laughs> he recalled to this giant crowd of people that he had sent me an email and that I had politely told him to shove off and I say F off really. Cause that was Kurt's words. And right. you know, like again, I just felt like, cool. I like this guy. Like <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah. he got the one email from me. I didn't have to, it didn't turn into a back right. and forth. He just understood like, cool. Joe has it. Right. Yeah. Let, let Joe do his thing. And he does. So that was yeah. great. I mean, yeah, but this was, I guess the illusion, but in the end it sort of all went uh, crumbling down and then, yeah, I guess even though the game released was like mixed reviews, but uh, yeah, the combat was always praised. I still, to this day, remember reading, reading or listening to the to the IGN review, and they were like praising the combat so so much, and I was just like, wow, like this, and and I think this was also the 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 thing that made me buy it because everybody was like praising it. I think on like podcast beyond or something, they were talking about how good the combat was. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, like this, there is something to it. And yeah, it is even mentioned in the book, like the combat was, um, there are like some, some yeah, like, like internal me metrics from EA and the combat was just like a, like a almost a hundred percent success rate, I guess, or like positivity rate. Yeah. It was really just, um, validating, I guess. Like mm -hmm. we didn't, we understood that we built good combat and certainly looking back on it, we would like to do a lot better and we've all grown since that. So we all, yeah, right. we could have done better. In fact, we, we had even better plans for the reckoning too. And it wasn't so much about more and more. It was about just quality and just making it better. We were in fact, I'm going to shrink the game because the game that we had put out was just so big. Yeah. Very huge. Yeah. But that, yeah, that uh, the EA marketing team got back to me with just that note of like, hey, we review every journalistic review out there. We rate the game across every axis mm -hmm. of like world building, art, and combat just blew through the charts. And here's the numbers. And it was just, um, you know, at that point, like <laughs> we, it was already kind of bittersweet because i didn't last so long but um, sure, yeah mm -hmm. it was just a great point of pride and we felt like we had something really special yeah but yeah crazy and then everything yeah i guess yeah nobody sort of saw it coming that then at one point there was like no no more paychecks coming out and then this was like yeah the the thing like everything unraveling for you for you people over there and then yeah, I guess nobody had it on the on the radar that uh, 38 was doing this uh, terribly because I think yeah there was just like this big news about like having like the received the loan from like the state of Rhode Island above about like 75 million dollars so I guess nobody expected really to be like laid off or not even paid anymore. Yeah, like we were busy getting ready for Reckoning 2. We were looking at right. potentially other publishers. There was a sale to 2K that might have happened and yeah, we, we were just not prepared for that right, yeah. at all. Like everybody just understood like 38's got money. We just released the game. Our money will start coming in soon. Uh, we're working on DLC and whatnot. So uh, yeah, just way out of the blue when you show up to work and you realize no one's been paid. And that it's, it's probably why we were all hanging on so long because we really didn't have an alternative and we were being told like, we have the checks. The checks are printed right here. We just can't give them to you because the money isn't in the bank. It's in transfer. It'll be there tomorrow. Right. We'll give you the checks tomorrow. And then the next day, it was like there was some holdup, some new holdup, and it just kept going in that direction. Where so like I, yeah, we it felt. I think it was about ten days right. from the moment that we weren't paid that we hung around the office until we were told. All right, go home. This thing's shutting down. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, really, yeah. truly unbelievable. I guess there must be like a real sort of chaotic frenzy going on there. Yeah, it's it's real anxiety inducing. Sure. Uh, I remember just noticing that like I would bounce from Twitter to Kotaku to Joystick to Facebook to email back to Twitter, and I just had this loop, and it didn't. I could run that loop in five minutes, and there would be something new. Crazy, showing yeah. up that mm -hmm. was interesting that, yeah so it was a it was a wild time i think everybody had to scramble to figure out what to do next and many of us were left with 
just a, with big problems to solve. Um, right, yeah, for, totally. Fortunately, I, I was okay, like financially. Um, I was able to land a new job, I think. But I, a lot of people had to move out of the area, just could not support hiring yeah. as many people as were being laid off that quickly. Yeah, totally. And I guess this is sort of also the theme, like to, like, so, so to loop it back to the book about like, yeah, companies ramping up big productions and then just laying laying everybody off because maybe revenue wasn't wasn't high enough or they just sort of realized the trend is moving into a different direction. And yeah, I guess also the big issue is like people are moving states, even moving countries um, to get to the new job. And uh, yeah, this and I think this, those are even your words that it's like not even like this can't be going on. This is not, this is not sustainable anymore. So I guess yeah, the question is like how do we how do we move on and how do and how does like recover um, factor in or like fit in into like trying to alleviate some of these issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that's a great way of just even presenting the problem is like how do we like go for sustainability? Right. Um, and I think as game budgets have grown and grown and grown, the team sizes have had to grow as well, and it's not really possible to. As teams get larger than, say, 100 people, there becomes just this uh, logistical problem of even hiring that many people in one place. So right, co-development yeah. becomes a thing. And so you have multiple people, multiple studios working on one game. Mm -hmm. And it's just this, a lot of studios get into this trap of we release a game and in order to get funding for the next game because we have to pay everybody that's already that we hired right. to ramp up for the first game we have to pitch an even bigger game mm -hmm. and so there's this sense of like the game studios have to keep growing they're not really incentivized to just stay the size that they are or just to stay small the appetites of right, yeah. investors in the market are that, that they have to keep growing but all it takes is one failure or near, near failure or even neutral reception and that means mass layoffs because now you're dealing with the scale of people that are in the hundreds for game development. Right. Yeah. So I think over time I've just realized uh, there's a, the tool sets, the economy, the ecosystem It's set up in so many ways to um, support independent developers better mm -hmm. and independent developers are, they're taking on more creative risk. They have more ability to hire diverse diversely like um and have diversity within their sort of creative culture so it's like just that those two things right there right. diversity creative risk pushing for sustainability themselves because they have a more like uh they they understand the economics of it mm -hmm. a little bit better they're they're tied to it whereas when i was a designer of a large team i didn't really care too much about Who, how much marketing is spending or how much the game needed to sell in order right. to keep my job mm -hmm. because every, everybody above me was telling me don't worry about that just make a good game right and when you're an indie developer you kind of have to be a bit more aware of the economics of yeah, totally. who am i selling to how many copies are we going to sell what's what's success for us mm -hmm. and that And that does shape your design decisions, but I think it should. I think certainly we should take risks in this industry, but they should be calculated risks and not wild. Um, <laughs> uh, in the in that wild decision making and development often happens in the big budgets. So really, what I try to do now is um, shift my attention towards supporting indies and supporting indies to be sustainable. So that's. I help them get funded. I help them shape their pitch, and their budget, and their game scope, their marketing positioning, and nudge them gently towards doing like a revenue share or profit sharing model with their employees so that everybody that works on the game gets a piece of that bonus as well. Right. And the yeah. game sells well. Uh, and that's just really important to me just to see that type of change in the industry. And I think the best way to make that change is through helping indies. So I'm, I'm 100% indie at this point. It's been four years of consulting and mm -hmm. each year i do less and less triple a work and more and more indie and now it's 100 percent. that's awesome yeah and uh, yeah hopefully this will continue and uh, yeah so everyone this was the topic also uh, joe picked that uh, his uh, yeah get to introduce some of the stuff he does at recover and i can't uh, wait to see yeah some of the stuff uh, that yeah you have been uh, yeah helping with um, i guess there's the new uh, what's it called the the cara and the Spirit of the something of spirit, I think. What is it called? The game? Oh yeah, Kana. Kana, right, right, yeah, exactly. 
one of the first indie teams I worked with. Um, That's... Wonderful team started by two brothers, Mike and Josh Greer, down in Orange County. And um, yeah, they have this really great game coming out on PlayStation 5 very, very soon. And I'm really excited for them. That's awesome, yeah. So, Joe, like, I know I could talk to you for hours more. I guess you have like countless of stories more. But we'll just end it here with like this very hopeful note of like, yeah, we're going to so I try to fix it through the indie scene. <laughs> and we will see yeah. where AAA will end up. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming into the show and uh, yeah, sharing these stories with you. I had a blast talking to you. And yeah, I guess I can only ask you, like, where can people find you and what is, uh, yeah, where, what are you currently working with? Or who are you currently working with? I can't always talk about who I'm currently working with. <laughs> sure. I've got a, um, a VR team uh, of my own called um, Lunar Lunchbox, and we're working on a game called Beyond Our Stars. Uh, another pair is these guys, um, Tim Conkling and John Demos, and they work on a game called The Feast. And if you ever, if you want to follow my Twitter, my Twitter is Bazooie, that's B-A-Z-O-O-I-E. And you can, I always put out there whatever teams will let me. Um, And you can just follow me that way, say hello, say you found me through the podcast. Um, Dorian, it's been great. Thanks a lot for the time. Yeah, thank you so, so much. I really loved it. Maybe we can do this sometime again in the future. And I would love that, yeah. Awesome, yeah. And yeah, um, if you really like to follow us on Twitter and on Instagram, I am uh, Dorian Chow on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to follow the show, it is Yumi Industry. We're also on Facebook and uh, Instagram and Twitter. And I sometimes post some behind the scenes information, some teasers. And uh, yeah, hopefully you will all enjoy the special. And I also hope to follow up this episode with another special related episode. And until next time, I guess, talk to you soon. Hear you soon. Bye.